Today is Wednesday, June 3rd. It's 10 o'clock. This is a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, today, we're going to be reviewing, uh, just for context, uh, we're working on Act 250 issues this year, uh, primarily in the form of H, it came over to us in the form of H926, but there are also many provisions related to planning in the Senate uh, Economic Development's uh, Housing Bill, S-237. Uh, so the pathway for moving our Act 250 work is to craft an amendment and bring it uh, into S-237. So today, tomorrow, and Friday, we'll be talking about three different areas. Uh, today is mostly focused on uh, municipal planning and development sections of the work. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be talking more about uh, force blocks, and on Friday, uh, the forks product industry and trails related aspects. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, we've invited Senator Sorotkin to join us. Since he's not here, and I don't want us to lose time, I'd like to turn um, then to Mr. Kowski. And um, when Senator Sorotkin gets here, my question to him is that our basic question that we start pretty much all our bills with when a sponsor comes in, and that is, what problem or opportunity are you seeing and how does that bill address it? Um, to, you know, the, the reasons for doing the bill. Um, so Ledge Council can't really speak to the reasons for doing the bill, but if you can, uh, Mr. Kowski, take us um, through, I think, so I think um, because Sorokin is not with us yet, I think I could start with my basic Act 250 refresher overview um, yeah. so we can set the stage for the requirements for development. So that might be a good place to start. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I made you co-host, Ellen. Thank you. So I um, provided multiple documents to Jude this, uh, this morning to post on the website, uh, including... Um, a couple of PowerPoints that are uh, background information on these subjects. So, so first, um, we haven't. This committee hasn't done a full deep dive into Act 250 um, recently. Although I know mo many of the members of the committee are very familiar with Act 250. So here is a sort of a PowerPoint list on, under my name as. Um, brief overview introduction. And it's a four slide uh, PowerPoint that has some key points about Act 250 so that you have them readily available as we move forward in this discussion. So um, first, the, the basic premise of Act 250, the state's land use and development law, no person shall sell a subdivision, commence development, or commence construction of a development or subdivisions without an Act 250 permit. Uh, so development and subdivisions are the two key definitions that we talk about. And so if you have a project, the, the, the place you want to start is determining if what you're doing meets the definition of development or is a subdivision. And when we're in Act 250 sort of realm, we often use the phrases Act 250 jurisdictional triggers or thresholds. And what we're largely talking about when we say that we're referring to the definitions of development. So whether or not your project triggers Act 250 is whether or not you have a development as defined. So this first slide has the eight definitions of development under Act 250. The two that we, pri or the three that we primarily talk about, I highlighted in yellow. We do, obviously the others are used regularly. So when you're doing an analysis, you have to make sure you look at all of them but we are often talking about um, acreage of land and what type of project it is. So the first one that's highlighted in yellow, development is defined as the construction of improvements for, a commercial, for any commercial or industrial purpose on more than 10 acres or land, 10 acres of land or one acre of land if the municipality does not have permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws. And so for a commercial purpose, we establish this 10 acre, one acre distinction. And so if the municipality does not have permanent zoning, it's a one acre threshold. If they do, it's a 10 acre threshold. 
the second one in yellow refers to ten or, the construction of 10 or more units of housing triggers Act 250 as development. And then also the construction of improvements for a governmental purpose, including municipal, county, state, or public purpose, if the project involves 10 or more acres. And we did recently talk about this type of project when we talked about the recreational trails recently. Um, we won't be talking about that too much today, but um, commercial, industrial, as well as the housing units will be relevant to our discussion. So there, so the other definitions of dev development include construction above 2,500 feet, um, communications tower, uh, ta broadcast towers uh, 50 feet or higher, uh, extraction of fissionable source, uh, source material, uh, oil or gas wells, and 340,000 340, gallons of groundwater per day. Uh, um, next, the definition of subdivision. It's the creation of 10 or more lots. Or in a town that doesn't have permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, six or more lots. So for subdivision, we don't have the 10 to one, we have a 10 lot to six lot um, difference. And then the other definition is uh, lots that are by uh, sale at a public auction, it's five or more lots. So those are the primary factors. <laughs> so next, the sort of brief but incomplete analysis that one would go to if they're thinking about permit requirements. Here are some of the questions you want to ask. What is the purpose of the development? Is it commercial, industrial, or for a governmental purpose? And we talked about that a lot with the recreational trails at the last meeting. If it is for a commercial purpose, does the town in which it is located have permanent so zoning and subdivision bylaws? So is it a 10 acre town or a one acre town? If it's a commercial project in a one, one acre town, is one or more acre of land involved? If it's a 10 acre town, 10 or more acres involved. And for commercial projects, involved land includes the whole tract. So is the whole tract of land 10 or more acres or one or more acres? If the answer is yes, and there are other ways to get there, but if the answer is yes, and if an Act 250 is permit is needed for any of the other um, definitions as well, the applicant must demonstrate that the project will comply with the 10 criteria of Act 250. And those are what are on the last slide. So this is a, a sort of quick, uh, chart of the criteria, um, very sort of um, boiled down to the basic. Uh, yeah, so do you want me to go through them all or is it just good to have them on a chart? I, I, um, if there's anything I'd like to, to point out, like it's, it might not be obvious how it applies, um, but let's just go through in two minutes. Uh, may I ask a question, please? Senator Campion, thank you. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Can, as you're going through this, can you tell, I'm assuming all of this criteria is the standard criteria. In other words, this is not, is this, is there anything in here that we as the, um, the commission for the next 50 years, uh, are those kinds of things incorporated into this? No, this is the no. status quo current this is law. This the status quo. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, I was going to reference at some point the Commission on Act 250's work uh, the next 50 years, which Senator Campion was a member of, um, comes up a little bit later when we start talking about the differences in S-237 and 926. But these four slides are status quo law as they are now. Okay. Right. Thank you. Good question. Good question. Okay. So uh, quickly, uh, criterion one is uh, no undue... Uh, water or air pollution, and the sub-criteria of those are uh, largely to do with water. So headwaters, waste disposal, wastewater, stormwater, water conservation, floodways, streams, shorelines, wetlands, 
Criter criterion two is, is there sufficient water? Criterion three, is there an undue burden on existing water supply? Criterion four, is there unreasonable soil erosion? Criterion five, unreasonable congestion, unsafe traffic conditions. Uh, six, unreasonable burden on educational services. Seven, unreasonable burden on governmental services. Eight is undue adverse effect on aesthetics, and that includes a few different things, uh, scenic and natural beauty, historic sites, natural sites, and necessary wildlife habitat and endangered species. Criterion nine is the big one. It's uh, got a lot of different components, but it's, is the project in conformance with the capability and development plan? And you sort of look at the, the many sub criteria to, to determine that. So there's impacts on growth, <laughs> primary agricultural soils, productive forest soils, earth resources, extraction of earth resources, energy conservation, private utility service, cost of scattered development, public utility service, public investments, rural growth areas. And then finally, is the project in conformance with the local and regional plan? Um, Ms. Schakowsky, so in, in criteria nine, conformance with capability development plan, um, who authors, I I'm just wanna pause and say, do those exist for all towns and regions and who authors them? So it actually refers to the capability and development plan, which is referred to in section 6042 of Act 250. And it is a um, kind of a mysterious and complicated subject uh, that we can talk about at a later time. But there was initially, as conceived under the original Act 250, the idea to have this uh, statewide capability and development plan. And great. I'm sorry, Ellen. So oh, yeah, no, Sarah can just join, so we should yeah, probably he's join. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's a, I, I'm guessing that's sort of a perfect point to jump off and go to Senator Sorokin, right? Was that your last slide? Yes. Great. Um, thank you. So good morning, Senator Sorokin. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, you're on mute still at the moment. And still muted. There we go. Good morning. Making a lot of bad mistakes here. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I I don't know if you suffered from this, but I tend to mess up my schedule quite a bit. So I was going handily along in my committee, running a committee, and then I realized I needed to be with you folks. So I just left that. I just left that committee and didn't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to just think you have a bad connection. That's all of us. Allison will, Allison will take over. Uh, I, I apologize. I hope I didn't screw things up too bad for your schedule. No, uh, Ms. Schakowsky jumped right in and helped us get started on a review of some Active 50 Basics. So thanks for coming. So, uh, we'll, I'll jump right to it since you have a committee you, you'll want to get back to. But, you know, uh, uh, we're looking at the 237 sections related to... Uh, planning and uh, which is where we work all the time in this committee and so the uh, I guess I'm thinking of this as a chance for you to tell us from your perspective what either problems you saw that you wanted to address through S237 or what opportunities you saw uh, that you wanted to address or some combination of the two but um, kind of a street smart view of what you saw going on that made you wanted to bring this legislation forward. Okay, well, I, as thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, my apologies for being late. Um, as you know, our committee uh, has been not only named the housing committee, but over the last few years, we put a lot of our energy into developing more housing. We have a, a housing crisis on many different fronts in the state of Vermont, which I won't go into in detail. Uh, fortunately, the administration was with us on the $37 million housing bond that produced over a quarter of a billion dollars in housing as a result of that bond um, of all ranges of incomes. Uh, and uh, we tried to do another bond this year and were unsuccessful because of bonding capacity. Uh, but fortunately, I think the administration was looking at 
alternative ways to improve uh, the housing stock in our state. And it's not always all about money. Some policies can make a difference as well. And that's what this bill is about, at least the first half of the bill. It's a lot of things dealing with municipal zoning, land use planning, uh, Act 250, that's trying to improve the density ability of housing stock and the cost, to reduce the cost of building housing in the state of Vermont, where some of the things that you'll hear about from the other witnesses are either duplicative uh, and costing developers money they didn't need to, to pay. So the administration, fortunately, as I said, over the summer had been working very hard to come up with a housing proposal that was less, it had some money financial aspects to it, which have sort of fallen by the side because of COVID, but had a lot of um, policy and statutory changes. And uh, as you know, Mr. Chair, they work with a very, very broad range of um, stakeholders over a six month period of time and came up with uh, um, a lot of proposals that are reflected in this bill, some of which we modified, some of which we added to. Uh, but I think one of the better tools that I've seen is a summary of the bill that was put together of how we passed it out of economic development was put together by Ellen. I don't know if that's on your webpage um, or if you want to, uh, I think you should look at it as a cheat sheet all the way through because it's in lay terms and it's short. You'll hear from other witnesses it could get very weedy and dense, some of the sections, but this outline really sums up this, the policy changes uh, very well. And I could go to some of them, uh, but as I've said to you all along, Mr. Chairman, our goal in our committee was to promote the development of housing. We tried not to change, um, uh, to try to avoid duplication in the permitting process and other areas, um, but we knew that your committee would get into the the details of some of these laws, whether it be Act 250 review or municipal planning and zoning. Uh, we don't think we did any damage from what we can hear from the witnesses we had. Uh, and we had pretty strong support uh, all the way through by the league and, uh, and, and most of the stakeholders. Uh, the biggest change probably is the trying to develop economically and housing uh, the, the benefits that are now come to only downtowns and to ex expand those to neighborhood suburban areas as well for more dense housing and to eliminate the Act 250 requirement around those, um, uh, around those uh, towns or suburbs that get the appropriate designation. Um, that was a big change and you'll see a lot of uh, minor land use changes while dealing with like ADUs, trying to promote uh, um, accessory dwelling units in uh, more areas of the state to try and allow for more small lot development, to allow quadplexes to be built in towns. Um, I could go into the details. You probably don't want me to do that, but I want to tell you of one major policy change from the administration's position. Uh, and you'll have to ask them how they feel about it. But um, the uh, originally, the administration came to us with all of these land use municipal changes on lot size, how you use, how you did ADUs, the Act 250 changes, all those things. And they were conditioned upon a town um, to get from a, a carrot based kind of thing to get towns to 
change their zoning laws um, within a certain period of time. They had it as a time delayed mandate. In the course, at the very end of December or January, the administration backed off that um, proposal whereby towns would have to comply with one major exception. They had an off ramp, which where they could say, this is too hard for us. Here's the reasons why we can't do it. And they could be let out and there would be a compilation of all the reasons town were giving. And then we would go to our next step. Uh, they backed off of that and said, they just said, these are all suggestions. Uh, we decided to do a, a hybrid of saying, we like your mandate better at the beginning, uh, but what we'll do is we'll give you um, three years to come in to compliance with these uh, mandates. And then if you still can't do it, you still have that off ramp to um, talk about constraints that make it too hard for you to do. So there are several off ramps here, but we're still trying to uh, promote the incentives for uh, towns that do comply with these changes. Um, can I ask a quick question? So how do you balance off um, the notion of you know, local control, uh, a town being expressing its own way of how it likes to look, feel, develop um, uh, for itself through planning and zoning, as opposed to, and I, I'm thinking, for instance, of the requirement to uh, allow development on lots of an eighth of an acre or less, and I can see how it plays out in the village we've moved to. One of the things that's pleasant about it is that I think houses, many houses are still on relatively large lots, um, trees around yards, stuff like that. Uh, that. That's why people pick this area, I think. One of the reasons. Um, would Bristol, for instance, be forced to allow subdivisions down to the one eighth of an acre as proposed? Even uh, if Local I, I don't, didn't. I, I don't think the answer to that is yes. I think the eighth of the acre example is for existing lots only. Um, so, but you can ask uh, Ellen and Chris Cochran more of the details of that. The, okay. over, the overli overriding question is a good one. I think the reason that the administration came forward with these policy suggestions was because they saw other states moving in this direction and several West Coast states among them, whereby unless you started to put pressure on, um, on communities, we're not going to be achieving the housing need and smart growth objectives that we talk about. So there needs to be some statewide policies that promote more inclusive and dense housing. And uh, there are other laws that I'm sure you're more familiar than I am where we don't defer entirely to each municipality, how they wanna grow, especially if they wanna qualify for some of our incentives. So uh, I can leave some of that to the administration, but it is a policy choice. If you're gonna take local control uh, into, um, into account, uh, you, you know, you, you may decide that we should just not do any of this uh, if that's the paramount uh, goal here. Okay. It was in front of our committee. Senator Campion. All right, thank you. So what I'm trying to understand, Senator Sorokin, is, is again the natural resources impact of this bill. And maybe you can help me with it. It sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, at one point the administration was supporting something. Now they seem to be Perhaps I don't want to. I will hear from the administration having a change of heart on a particular position, but I think overall, what I'm trying to get a sense of is the the natural res the impact on natural resources as it relates to this bill, which is largely, of course, our committee's jurisdiction, and whether or not there are what those exempt if there are exemptions that are happening, if there are things that happening are happening that we really need to have our eye on. Uh yeah, I, I, I guess what I thought that you would have your eye on would be 
uh, like for instance, where we took away uh, Act 250 jurisdiction over the neighborhood, the new districts that are being created. Uh, did we do that in an appropriate fashion? And, and whether you feel that's a smart change of policy that the municipality will have to have the same guardrails and uh, protections that an Act 250 process would have. So is that a duplication? I think the administration and most people say, yeah, the way we've written it up here, we're, we're not really giving up any natural resources protections by getting rid of the Act 250 protections. But I would certainly welcome natural resources double checking that because uh, in terms of the wording that we came up with, but the goal was not to, uh, it was just to get rid of duplication and to allow for more cost-effective housing to be built. Um, I don't know if that uh, specifically answers your question, but in each of these areas, I think the policy, I mean, uh, uh, I'd be anxious to hear what the policy issues against the greater density is from a natural resources perspective or the smart growth. This is a smart growth bill. What, what the smart growth proposals here in each instance are, if you don't like those from a natural resources perspective, I'm not exactly sure what the arguments would be. On the technicalities of how we structured to get to those points, you know, we could have easily missed nuances about how Act 250 works or how zoning laws work. But I think in terms of our overall policy, I think Vermont has been moving in a small growth direction. This expands upon that. And it also, in a very major way, I think will ultimately result in uh, more housing and in the neighborhoods, I think we want to see housing in. Nice. Well, I would expand a little on um, uh, Senator Campion's framing of the question around um, the natural resource impacts. To, to me, um, I, I would not want to sort of um, overlook any of the 10 criteria. You know, I mean, it's a, the strength of Act 250, I think, is its comprehensiveness and that it tries not to look at a project through such uh, a narrow window that it overlooks uh, an unintended negative consequence. So I think I would still want to make sure that we're thinking about you know, all of them as we work our way through. Um, so I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to <laughs> be difficult, but I do want to test a little because I, I, you know, this is feedback I'm getting from instance from a, um, Mr. Sawyer, who's Director of Planning and Development in St. Albans, and Stan Braden, who's Chair of the St. Albans Planning Commission, who had some real concerns about, for instance, Section 2. So did you hear from, you know, local planners who had concerns about the degree to which this would um, take decision-making powers away from them on, on planning? I would phrase it this way. We certainly had the League of Cities and Towns involved in this process, all and all of these planners uh, worked with the administration during the six month buildup. Uh, that I've, I've seen those comments from St. Albans and Franklin County. They did come to us after we passed out the bill. Uh, but they were certainly aware of um, what we were doing. Um, you know, I think they may have preferred the uh, proposal from the administration, which was sort of making this everything being suggested here or most of what being suggested here as a voluntary goal. We went sort of a hybrid where we went half of a way where uh, we still provided for an off ramp, but we wanted them to uh, make a, have more incentive to, um, go in this direction in the first three years. I would, I would uh, defer to Chris on that shift. Uh, we basically disagreed with the administration 
Okay. We didn't think, we, we wanted to get there. We didn't want to just have an aspirational goal out there. Sure. And we thought the way we did it was a little, it's not, it's, it's, you know, towns still have all the ways to get out of this they need, but I think we've made it um, more attractive for them to work in this area to get towards, um, towards this kind of plan. Sure. Um, Senator McDonald, then Senator Campion. Um, I'm, I remember two years ago, or I think it was two years ago, where, that, where we put together a commission to take a look at the Act 2 changes after 50 years. And um, that we have that product that has been sent to us, but this bill appears to sort of carve out a whole bunch of the possible recommendations of those commissions and is silent to the um, other recommendations. Um, that's, it strikes me as unusual, but this is, you know, an unusual year. What, what is, the, what is the primary reason that your committee has come to that there is a lack of affordable housing um, in our cities? Well, in towns. I mean, I mean, there's been report after report on the problems being faced by Vermonters in terms of both housing stock, its quality and its affordability. And our committee did a tour around the state this fall, we went to five different regions of the state having very large turnouts from people telling us of their problems. And uh, we could always try, this would be a terrible year to try and throw money at the problem and we're gonna do our best, but uh, it's forward thinking policies like are in here that can be a win-win for uh, a lot of uh, the builders, the uh, no, that's not wasn't my question. What, what well, is the is the in your in your tour? What was the reason that people told you that folks weren't buying houses in in municipalities and there were you know a lot of for sale signs and they weren't being purchased? Um, why why are people not moving into villages now? What's the what's the problem that's preventing them. Well, I think if when, when you hear about the individual proposals here, that answer will become evident in those solutions that we're suggesting. But people came forward, developers, and said there are permitting hassles that are unnecessary. There are land use restrictions that are not working in the favor of more housing development. And this is not, Senator, this is not a, a an Act 250 bill per se, as you'll hear about it. There's one section that lifts Acts 250 for development of housing in neighborhoods, but that's the only change. We have the same law that exists for downtowns right now. We have priority housing for downtowns being relieved of some Act 250 requirements, and now we're just extending it to a larger downtown growth center. Well, um I met Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you in a, in a moment, but the it was it's members of, of National Resources Committee, there is nothing new about developers telling us that affordable housing would become more affordable if we just removed a bunch of the requirements that that builders had to have building new housing. And um, it hasn't really made much of a difference because um, people who don't have enough money to buy houses don't buy them. And um, with what uh, you can ask a minister, you know, I don't know what the statistics are for this year, but you know, 40% of new construction is you know, for, for second and third homes. Um, it's not a, that seems to be the underlying concern and making it cheaper to buy second and third homes um, isn't going to solve the problem of people not being able to buy the first one. Um, and I, Senator Campion was on the Act 250 Commission. I'd certainly yield to him, Mr. Chair. Yeah, well, well, Senator Campion and then Senator Parent, next. So what, what 
I'm trying to understand is, Senator, is when you mentioned that it's there isn't, you said something about this not being an Act 250 bill or, or things like that, and, and I understand that, but we are pulling away, correct me if I'm wrong, as the bill is written from Act 250 by giving a lot of jurisdiction to the towns that can now ignore possibly Act 250 and base their decisions on their own zoning. Is that so? That's my first question. Is that accurate? I, I don't think so. Uh, what we were told was that the Act 250 requirements would effectively be met by the towns uh, because they would have to go through a qualification process to show that their process for approving subdivisions and other Act 250 related uh, 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 land use actions uh, would be every bit as um, protective as Act 250 would be, and I, I would I would think uh, better off leaving that to the um, uh, to Chris and others. I remember we, I had, several, we if, had they're, if they're the same, then I'm not sure as stringent. I'm not sure why to move away then from the Act 250 if they're equally as stringent because they have to do them twice apparently. They have to go through both processes twice now. So did your committee take the consider take up the idea of just going through the Act 250? Um, no, I think we did not. Uh, we were presented uh, because of the way downtowns had worked, where we lifted some or all of the Act 250 requirements. Uh, it was the pattern was to to go in that direction rather than getting rid of the municipal report. Do you remember who said to you that the qualification was the same? Because having served on this commission, the qualifications for downtown are not the same as Act 250. No, the qual- Did that come from Cochran, do you remember? Um, I don't know who specifically said it, but it's that was what we were left to, that we weren't losing protections of Act 250 by uh, eliminating for this for this new category of uh, neighborhoods. So, uh, can I jump in to uh, uh, hopefully help? And that is, so you. council just when you were coming in, Senator Sorokin was relating to us that thirty three, I think, of the forty four pages relate to planning. So sometimes I think we get tripped up a little by being overly literal, like saying Act two fifty versus other planning. So <laughs> where we work is two titles. We work, our Act 250 work is by, in law, in Title 10. All our municipal planning and development law is in Title 24. And we, it's like left and right hands for us. So whether we call it Act 250 or not, we still are conscious of how we're influencing land use and development, whether we're doing it through Title 24, or we're doing it through Title 10. And sometimes, uh, and 250 is just in 10. And there are a lot of changes in this bill that happen to be in 10, and then a lot of them are in Title 24. So we're equally interested, and I think in the end, what we're looking for is uh, planning of equal um, comprehensiveness and effectiveness whether it lands in one place or the other. Uh, and so. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I, I was just responding to the, the Act 250 commission uh, focus. And uh, that's the one place where I know Act 250 appears in this bill. But yes, there's definitely a lot of land use planning thing that need to be looked at by your committee. I think it's, um, I, as I said, I'm giving you the over, overview. I think it would help if you start getting into the specific changes that we recommended to promote more affordable housing in Vermont and 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 see if they're problematic. Great. Well, oh, great. Um, Senator Parent had a comment slash question. I don't know which while you're still here. Comment, but you know, when we want to talk about explaining and and um, you know, I, I've explained it, but you know, I, I own a couple of apartment buildings um, in St. Albans and I've talked to them about it, but some of the regulations, you know, that 
that frustrate me and, and, and I've spoke to the plan commission, they are looking to change it, but I have a three car garage on a nice property that has, um, next to my parents. And I want to actually tear the garage down because it's, it's older and build two apartment units, a new garage with two apartment units above it. And right now the city wouldn't allow that under their current regulations, but they'd allow me to subdivide and build a duplex in the backyard. And from a, from a natural resource perspective, you think you would just be easier to build a garage with another floor on top of it, two units versus subdivide and take up green space. So I do think, you know, that's where areas, when we talk about housing being affordable in some of these communities, there are people like me who are looking for unique ways to obviously increase our investment, but also not take up green space and take up any more, you know, uh, of, of what we have. And so, um, you know, I, I think this bill has a lot of merits. I think there are places and, and, I, and I understand the concerns of communities like St. Albans, um, but I, I do think there are ways that we can take their concerns into play, but also nudge them towards ways to, to meet some of our, public policy goals, because that would be an affordable way for me to build two units. You're talking $120,000 to build those two units versus if I had to go buy land and build and do that, it'd be much more expensive. Sure, sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, because I like to say, I think you'll like the sections on accessory dwelling units, because we liberalize that quite a lot. And that's a, a law that I've been involved in for a long time, representing seniors. So I it's an example of some of the changes we could make that don't cost money that could also help promote more units. So, right. Well, and I apologize for, for my delay, uh, yeah. trying to deal with the economic recovery package and right now. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us. You know, the, you. You, we're not in our committee room, but if we were on the wall, you'd see this sign that says, you know, start with yes. So we're looking. Yeah, we that's interested. why we're not in the committee room today. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> to save you from that. Um, no, I'm saying that because the, the questions we have are uh, we're uh, I think we're aiming for the same kind of place. We want uh, high quality development and uh, we're trying to be supportive, but we also want to make sure that we're paying attention to how we're getting there and how it would work with existing law. So, okay. Thanks. Well, you're you're in good hands with Chris Cochran. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So we are um, we jumped off at the end of your four page uh, presentation uh, PowerPoint, Ms. Schakowsky. I don't know if you have. Another document you want to share with us, although I'm seeing that we had a lot longer visit with Senator Sorotkin than I anticipated. So um, what did you have on your list of things you wanted to share with us? I know you also gave us a great summary document. Yes. So um, it's sort of up to you. I gave you that the short PowerPoint to start as the intro to Act 250. Um, I did also prepare a second PowerPoint um, that has a comparison between current law S-237, and it includes a little bit about H-926. And then it talks about some of the municipal zoning regulations that you were just talking about with Senator Sorokin. Uh, there is also the summary document of S-237, so. So let's um, spend, can we, is it reasonable to just spend maybe 10 minutes or so to go through your sort of that at a high level, I <laughs> see so you smiling. Um, I don't know how much time you think you need to look that side by side by side, but that would be very helpful because as we talk to our next witnesses, they're all gonna be talking about different pieces of that side by side by side. Sure, it's, uh, I tried to prepare a lot of in information and so uh, wherever you wanna start, I also am probably gonna have to join the house floor sometime around 11.30, so I might have to jump off, but, um, we so can just start yeah. wherever you want. Yes, please. So let's look at that side by side by side and we'll we'll use it as a high level overview for the time being and then we'll get into the other witnesses, uh, but you'll have, have us seeing the lay of the land better. Uh, Senator Campion, before we go on with that, you have something? No, I, I can wait. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so on the committee page under my name, um, Act 250, 2020 comparison. So uh, to start in, on the left column, 
We have some of the information on the current law uh, as it relates to S-237. So starting on page one, current law, we just talked about the Act 250 jurisdictional triggers for subdivision and development. Yep. As we've already alluded to, S-237 exempts designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas from Act 250. So they're not included under those definitions. So any development in those areas are exempt. Um, also currently under uh, existing law, there are already a number of uh, incentives for these designated areas, including uh, section 6086B is findings and conclusions for downtowns, which allows them to go through an expedited process uh, with no permit fees. Uh, so they only have to address some of the Act 250 criteria uh, there's also a 50% reduction in permit fees already for designated uh, neighborhood development areas. Uh, so 237 repeals those because they're not necessary anymore if, that, if these areas are exempt from Act 250. Um, also, priority housing projects under Act 250 are exempt, and they're defined as mixed use or mixed income housing in a designated area. So uh, that's already an incentive for these areas. So we have to amend that definition in S-237. And S-237 also addresses that um, loss of incentive by requiring that designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas um, add additional um, affordable housing requirements to sort of address this lost incentive. Uh, also, Current, under current law, once a project is under Act 250 jurisdiction, once an Act 250 permit exists, it exists in perpetuity. Um, S-237, as well as H-926, creates this new opportunity to extinguish Act 250 permits. This is a new concept. So any, not only do projects, do new projects in these areas not need to go through Act 250, existing projects in those areas can have their Act 250 jurisdiction um, removed. And then, as we've already discussed, projects currently may need to go through the municipal zoning process based on what the municipality requires. And uh, that is true regardless if they're exempt or not. And so that will be the sort of default if, they, uh, if the municipality has those regulations. And as I mentioned in the overview, uh, there is a, uh, Act 250 sort of already acknowledges this by the 10 acre town, one acre town sort of distinction. Um, towns that have permanent zoning regulations are 10 acre towns, meaning that um, smaller projects in those towns are not required to go through Act 250. So um, S 237, so that's the information. There's also a technical correction for mixed income housing. Um, we haven't talked, that's sort of a separate topic. It, it's needed, it needs to be updated based on a change in procedure at the uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, and just by way of comparison, a lot of the language that's in S-237 is in H-926, the big Act 250 bill from the House. But there was a floor amendment to 926 that extends this exemption to designated village centers. Um, so. Okay. So I have a, a big picture question on this. The, um, and we can come back to it or just file it away maybe. By the, you know, I think one of the things I've wondered and others have asked the same question is, in the process of becoming a designated downtown, do you in essence go through an Act 250 proceeding or something like it? So you've you've actually addressed the 10 criteria. Um, and now these are already sort of baked into that area because someone's thought about it all ahead of time. So that coming in to a downtown, it's like, well, why would you start from scratch? You're a designated a downtown or, uh, village center, whatever it is, is, has basically done that planning on your behalf before you ever bring your proposal forward. Is that? So 
Um, we do have Chris Cochran, who is the expert on designated areas, but I do have this second slide that addresses what you just talked about. So okay. uh, the different designations, there are five of them. There are three core designations and then two add-on designations, and they have different requirements for how a town um, gets designated. Different things are required to be demonstrated by the town. Currently, um, designated downtowns, neighborhood development areas, and village centers are not required to have permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws. They are required to have their planning process confirmed. So they are required to have a planning process, but they're not required to have the zoning bylaws. And um, a long time ago, Senator Campion may remember that one of the uh, proposals that came from the commission on Act 250, um, which was the sort of um, counter offer to this exemption was to create a new designation an enhanced designation that would require that all of the um, areas that wanted to be exempt had permanent zoning, as well as that zoning addressed all of the Act 250 criteria. So I'm going to, the rest of the slides on this uh, talk about that a little bit, but while it's true that a lot of these designated areas, um, there is overlap, it's not exact as that's sort of what you guys were just talking about. So, so these areas are not required to have um, zoning. Um, the NRB keeps a list of the 10 acre towns and the one acre towns. Um, it's a roughly 50, 50 split on who has zoning versus who doesn't. And so I looked at the list. There are 23 towns that have designated downtowns. There are six neighborhood development areas. And of those, uh, it, based on the NRB's list, it looks like the Wilmington, which is one of the designated downtowns does not have permanent zoning bylaws, and it looks like it's the only one. Um, and then the town, there are six, those six designated areas, they all are, they are also, uh, the neighborhood development areas, they all have permanent uh, zoning and bylaws. So that's just, did I answer the question you just asked? Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, <laughs> This is a little bit drinking from a fire hose to keep all these details straight, but I get the picture. Some, some have, and we'll have to figure out what they're, how to, um, sort of a balanced way of looking at. I think everyone's interested in, if I had to boil it down, I'd say everyone in this committee is interested in good planning. Um, and how do you ensure it happens regardless of what we call it and uh, under what rubric it happens. Uh, Senator Campion. Yeah, <clears throat> good planning. And, and I know that uh, the chair, we're also interested in protecting our natural resources. Um, with that, that of course is involved with good planning. When I'm trying to uh, understand myself in all of this, Ellen, uh, is where exactly there is going to be, or there is a push, um, away from good natural resource uh, protections. And, you know, um, one of the things I keep hearing is outside of some of these developments, we are taking away uh, certain protections. So if you could just keep that in mind as you take us through this and as you communicate, at least to me, as things pop up, I think others would be interested also. Where is it that we really are saying um, there will be less protection than there is now? And I know in some cases that might be difficult uh, there, but even, you know, to actually determine, but as you point out, there are, even if it's in certain towns, if it's in certain communities, where is this sort of give and take? Um, and where is the, the negative impact, the potential for a negative impact on our natural resources, which this committee is responsible for protecting. Sure, um, and I hoped to address some of that in the later slides on this. Um, I'm still a bit new to municipal zoning and it does vary widely based on the town. Um, so I think we will maybe get some help on some of those questions from the planners also. Great, thank you. Um, and let's try to finish if we can, even though I know we're 
in hurry up mode here. Um, but if we can just see, and you can sort of introduce the slides you have in the next five to 10 minutes, because we have an hour basically for our four remaining guests today. And um, I'm sure they're good at responding. <laughs> but so let's keep cruising along here. Thank you. Right, so uh, municipal zoning, if a town has municipal zoning, there's different ways that a project can go through it. Um, zoning districts are established and these districts uh, state what types of development are uh, permitted as of right in that area or which, which are for uh, our conditional use and that need extra um, approval to move forward. So, uh, the, the permitted right as of right development goes through, usually goes through the zoning administrator and is a more uh, potentially simple form, whereas conditional use is a little bit more of an in-depth review. Um, they also, both types of projects may also require site plan review by the municipality. Um, so here are some of the criteria that are used in conditional use. And um, I'll highlight that some of them do overlap with Act 250. So, uh, when a municipality is looking at a, a development that is a conditional use, um, it shall not result in an undue adverse impact on any of the following capacity of existing or planned community facilities. And that likely relates to sort of uh, criteria six and seven character of the area affected uh, relates a bit to criterion eight, which is aesthetics under act 250. Traffic on roads and highways, that relates to criterion five under Act 250. Uh, bylaws and ordinance then in effect. Um, I do not know the full contours of this area, but one thing that comes to mind is that most, if not all municipalities have a uh, flood hazard area and river corridor bylaws. So this does touch on the criterion one. Some do have um, some wildlife bylaws also, so that there could be some um, uh, overlap with criterion eight there, and then utilization of renewable energy resources. They may also require a minimum lot size, distance from adjacent or nearby uses, performance standards, um, criteria related to the site plan review, which is on the next slide, and any other factors. And then they, the municipality may also, may also adopt one or more of the 10 criteria um, for conditional use review. So uh, some municipalities have, um, but they're not required to. So then with site plan review, um, they, a municipality looks at these um, criteria for different types of projects, and they largely relate to criterion eight and criterion five. So adequacy of parking, traffic, landscaping and screening, protection of renewable resources, uh, exterior lighting, uh, location and size of signs, and then other matters in the bylaws. So those are some of the criteria that a municipality um, may apply when they're doing their review of a project. Is that a, a sort of including list? In other words, that uh, under law, they can be um, come up with other criteria of interest to the town and add them. They're not prevented from I don't know what it would, <laughs> what an so, Right, so broadly municipalities only have the powers given to them by the legislature, um, but they are get, there are a number of powers that they have available to them through their bylaw power and both conditional use and site plan allow for um, them to address uh, other things through their bylaws for this review. Right, okay. Right. I mean, if I wanted to dream something up, I might say noise. I don't see noise anywhere, but um, in some neighborhoods, you might, I don't know, if someone's going to operate a home business, how noisy could it be? You know, that kind of thing. All right. So thank you. Yep. And then um, there's just some information on this slide about some of the procedures in municipal zoning. So, um, a conditional use review is 15 day notice posted in the newspaper three places and to the adjoining landowners. Site review, a site plan review only requires seven day notice and three public places and adjoining landowners. Um, appeals may be brought by an interested person, which is slightly different than under Act 250, um, which is 
sort of party status under Act 250 is based on um, particular any person with a particularized interest under the criteria, whereas uh, interested person, uh, two of the, the relevant definitions are um, a person owning or occupying property in the immediate neighborhood who can demonstrate physical or environmental impact on their interests, or any 10 persons who may be any combination of voters or real property owners within a municipality. So uh, slightly different of who can participate in these proceedings. Well, that is very helpful. So that's the end of this um, PowerPoint. Well, thank you. Um, any questions for Ms. Tchaikovsky before we go on to uh, hear from some of our other guests today? Okay. So then I'd like to invite um, next um, Mr. Cochran and Mr. Hemrick. I don't know if you want to sort of do the CAG team on this. The, the time is yours to use. Uh, basically, you've heard the discussion so far. I think what we're looking for is um, a sense, the, kind of the same question I uh, asked Senator Sorokin at the outset, what problem or opportunity did you see and how does this bill uh, attempt to address that? Yeah, um, yeah, I think um, Jacob and I are going to tag team. If I may, can you also keep some of these natural resource questions in mind? Uh, I think it would be helpful to hear from you as it relates to where, again, this push and pull is as it, uh, on our natural resources. Yeah, I mean, I can just quickly just try to answer that question. I'm sorry, I can't turn my internet or my video on. My daughter's in school right now, and we have one. <laughs> we can support one connection at once. Um, we did some analysis looking at the different designated centers and kind of where the natural resources impacts were. And, and the, the areas that we're proposing to exempt from Act 250 are downtowns and neighborhood areas. These are areas that represent you know, hundreds of years of investment in infrastructure and building. Um, and looking at them carefully, there are not a lot of natural resource impacts in these areas because they're essentially human habitat areas. Um, so above and beyond, you know, kind of, you know, river corridor protections and things of that nature, we were comfortable that making it easier to develop in these centers and by concentrating development in these centers, we were taking the pressure off the natural resources areas, off the natural resources in our working lands and our forests. Um, so it was a way to channel development to where we want to see it grow and, dis and, and discourage development where we'd like to see natural resources protected. Does that, but to, to answer your specific question, it doesn't align up perfectly. You know, all 10 criteria are not perfectly aligned with all local bylaws. Um, there's a lot of the same flavor, um, but again, these are areas that most everybody agrees that we'd like to see development happen. So how can we make it easier to, to support smart growth, smart growth values in these areas. So is, are there any gaps between, you know, what Act 250 does and what you're proposing? Yeah, right. it doesn't, yeah, that doesn't align up perfectly. Um, okay. I think there so, again, are if, some things that are missed. Second, if I may, I just want you to give us your assessment of where the push is going to be in terms, are you saying that there's going to be possibly no uh, pull back with regard to natural resources protection with the exemptions that you're proposing? I can't say that specifically, but I think the thing to remember is that, you know, all of the a &R permits that are typically rolled up in an Act 250 permit, they are still going to take place. Um, so, um, you know, protections that are part of other state permits are not proposed for exemption. What we're talking about exempting is just the Act 250 process. And the, the presumption there is, you know, Act 250 was created 50 years ago. Um, it was put on the map to fill our gaps in our local land use policies. Communities weren't prepared for the development that was coming. I think you know the story, but a lot's changed in 50 years and communities now are a lot more sophisticated than they ever were um, in reviewing development and projects. And I think, you know, when you look at the, you know, Ellen talked about the basically, you know, 10 unit trigger that Act 250 has, um, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't graduated. It doesn't look at communities in different places 
in different ways. So it treats, you know, South Royalton um, that doesn't have zoning in the same way it treats, you know, Bennington, Manchester, you know, um, St. Albans that have staff who do development review and have sophisticated regulations. Um, so in a lot of ways, you know, we are, we are recognizing the good work that municipalities have done in the past 50 years, um, and we're giving them some deference. Um, and what we're doing by eliminating the Act 250 review is making it easier to develop in the areas where we said we want to see development happen. Right. Act 250 in itself. The chair just said, and I think he was right, that, you know, A&R permits, you know, they don't address things like noise and river corridors and aesthetics and historic preservation. Yeah, but part of the designation process does, as Ellen was talking about, um, aesthetics is absolutely core to a designated downtown process. We, we insist that communities do um, design review because we're part of the benefits are tax credits. And we want to make sure that we're investing in buildings and our community character, not taking that away. Um, municipalities right now, you know, regulate floodplains. Um, um, I would hope in the same way that that A and R does and the Act 250 does. Um, so, you know, again, we, we're, we're trusting their sophistication and, um, I, I Who's don't think there's, are you trusting municipalities to do their work? And what um, about, what about river corridor protections? Um, floodplains okay. and river cor cor corridor protections are talked about, um, in this bill, um, and there are provisions to in, you know, ensure that municipalities have those in places to get to achieve this designation. Okay. Um, but to get to the, the chair's question about, you know, why do we need this? You know, um, why are these changes necessary? Um, several years ago, this committee passed um, provisions called, and I think Ellen mentioned these priority housing project provisions that exempted certain um, qualified affordable housing projects from Act 250. We've had an affordable housing crisis forever. Within these designated centers are areas that everybody agrees that housing development should occur. Um, what this does is this levels the playing field for all types of development within these centers that have achieved the designation process. Um, our research showed, you know, looking back and interviewing um, applicants who use the priority housing project provisions, it saved them about, not a ton of money, but maybe like $60,000 in permit fees, and it saved them about six months in permit time frame. But where the real savings was for them was the reduced risk. Um, as, as everybody knows, Act 250 permits are, are easily appealed. And I think a good example of kind of what we're trying to minimize is in Montpelier, um, I think in 2018, the community bonded for a parking garage um, to support, you know, greater vitality in the community to get more people, more boots on the ground, supporting our downtown businesses. That project was appealed. It continues to be on appeal and it's, it's held up. Other important projects, the community wanted to build a hotel and it needed the parking garage built to support the hotel development. So that project has stopped, but if not, a hundred feet away from them, there was a priority housing project that built the new transit center. It created 30 units of housing. Um, it was not subject to local Act 250 review. It was subject to local review and act in a &R permits. It was built and it was leased up, you know, almost the day that it opened, you know. So you know, why, are we, why are we treating different types of projects differently? How can we make sure that since most of us agree that Development within these centers is the place we'd like to see them grow. We have an affordable housing project. I mean, we have an affordable housing affordability challenge that we never seem to quite tackle. How can we make broad systemic changes to our state land use and our local land use to align them to support the outcomes we all say we want? That's the intent of S-237. How can we work together to get these, make these centers strong and ensure development happens in a way where we want them to happen, where we have water and in, water and wastewater infrastructure. 
um, <clears throat> where natural resources impacts are going to be limited because they're largely completely developed and paved. You know, how do we make these things happen? And by removing the Act 250 review, it removes one step, it reduces a lot of risks and ensures um, people who are interested in investing in these communities and building them up have an easier path. So I appreciate the comment about, you know, again, the natural resources piece, mm -hmm. but I want to go back to the river corridors, if I may, for a minute, Mr. Chair. Please. So it seems to me that there is more impact on the river corridors with this bill than what exists currently. Do you agree with that, Chris? Well, not necessarily. I mean, if you look at many of our communities um, and if you look at the river corridor procedures, um, like Montpelier, for example, just for familiarity, but um, they're armored banks, they're managed channels, you know, they are not going to be modified in any significant way because of the built environment around them. What this bill does, in fact, is ask communities to look upstream and downstream for opportunities to protect floodplain to reduce hazards and risks um, within our centers for areas that aren't developed. So they're, I, I don't think it's going to increase our flood risk in any significant way. Um, it would allow development to occur within centers, um, but these areas are already developed and these uh, additional development, so long as it doesn't encroach any closer to the river as existing development is not going to make matters worse. Um, Chris, can you say something about, uh, you know, what's required to achieve the, uh, these designations? I think in part, whether we're calling something Act 250 or a designation, it's the robustness of the planning review uh, that uh, is sort of at the heart of the matter. Yeah, it, yeah. I'll, I'm gonna. Um, I'll talk just briefly about the downtown part, and then I'm gonna ask Jacob to talk about the neighborhood development area. It's a lot more robust. Um, downtown. Again, these are super small areas. These are highly concentrated areas. These are just the commercial districts. Um, the, the primary goal of the designation was to create or delineate the commercial district that, that needed investment in existing historic commercial buildings. Um, that law was passed in you know, t about 2000 and it candidly is not super rigorous on local review requirements. The biggest review requirement that you know, communities must have is prove, you know, prove that they have water and wastewater capacity to support new development. They have to have some kind of um, proof, uh, a planning process in place to assure orderly development. Um, they have to prove that they can do design review in some meaningful way to ensure our tax credits, our investment to improve the existing buildings are not wasted. Um, there are other check boxes that off the top of my head, I can't get you, but I can follow up and get you a complete list of all the different designations and all their requirements. Um, Jacob can talk more about the neighborhood area development area designation. That's our most modern designation. Um, and it creates a much more rigorous process, um, that does align better with Act 250 values and goals. Right, and so for the neighborhood development area, we're looking that there's a wastewater uh, system um, or wastewater service available for the proposed area. We check to make sure that the municipal planning process is confirmed by the RPC. Um, the current, uh, current law uh, requires the exclusion of flood hazard areas. And in the bill that you have, it would um, ease up on that. And the reason why is uh, that uh, the the flood hazard and the river corridor um, regulations uh, or mapping, um, they're not, uh, that was a desktop exercise done. And, um, and there's an incentive in this bill to get more communities to adopt the river corridor regulations, um, but allow the uh, neighborhood development area to overlay that. And that would allow for flood um, flood safe infill based on a more granular analysis at, at the local level. We also look at the local bylaws to see that they have complete streets provisions um, that is compatible with the historic register, register districts. We're looking at important natural resources like steep slopes, um, rare threatened and endangered species. Um, and, uh, and we're looking at uh, to what extent the municipal bylaws welcome housing. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty thorough analysis. 
Okay, thank you. I'm just looking, uh, are there other committee questions on this? So uh, I'm, I don't want to pick on something too narrow in the bill. I know there are, there's a lot of aspects, but uh, I'm sort of hearkening back to that one eight, one eighth of an acre requiring, you know, if you have town sewer and water, um, I don't know if it's one or the other. Uh, Bristol's kind of an interesting mix. There's town sewer, but many people are on their own wells. Uh, I don't know if there's any, no, well, it's a, anyway, it's a mixture. There's a mixture. I, I think I said that backwards. We're on town water, but we uh, have septic. And I think that's true for many uh, neighbors. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, would the town be told, well, it's your bylaws that that uh, need to accommodate subdivisions down to the one eighth of an acre level, and which would create, you know, on some logical level, you'd say, well, yeah, there'll be opportunities for quite a bit of infill. Um, but it may well be that uh, a town feels like part of its character is having that green space in a neighborhood. So is that choice left to them or are, will they no longer have the opportunity to make that decision for themselves about that kind of uh, neighborhood density? Um, Jacob, are you still there? Yeah, I, and I can jump in. And I think one of yeah. the, I'll, I'll just start but with an answer to uh, Senator McDonald's question to Senator Chirac and kind of what changes did they see about the housing market? And, and what we know is that um, our housing stock is getting older. Our household sizes are going down. Uh, the condition of these old large homes are generally not appealing to uh, or, or um, do not align with the budgets of downsizing seniors. Or, or new families. And as much as people would like to have uh, a large a home with a large lot, uh, many people are, are priced out of that market. And in Bristol, I know that um, you have uh, excellent sandy soil, uh, the downtown served by sewer, but most of the, uh, the surrounding neighborhoods are not. Under this proposed bill, the eighth acre uh, provision wouldn't apply um, outside of the downtown, it would be the, the quarter uh, quarter acre provision, and and we know that uh, land um, the more land you uh, require as a municipality per unit, the more expensive that unit becomes, and uh, and I think there's a lot of natural resources intersections to uh, Senator Campion's point that we know that walkable communities um, mean that people are driving less, they're walking more, they're healthier, there's less pressure on the working lands uh, to develop. And, uh, and so uh, lowering that threshold for a walkable settlement and allowing more infill development in places served by water and sewer makes that state investment in water and sewer more sustainable. I mean, I, 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 very few municipal water and sewer enterprises are flush with money. And part of that is because they were built with tremendous federal subsidy that is just no longer present. And so how do you make those enterprises more sufficient? You support infill housing, you make that housing uh, uh, more affordable. And, and I think that's what this bill does, is establishes new provisions uh, for municipal bylaws to make it possible to build housing in places that are close to daily destinations with economic opportunities for jobs um, and, and lowers the land cost associated with each unit. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, and, and I would add that, you know, this is, I think this is modeled after, um, you know, work done in, in other jurisdictions. Um, just because you're enabling these lots to happen doesn't necessarily mean people are going to take that opportunity. Um, and that was the experience, I think, in Portland, um, where they enabled smaller lots, but they didn't see a groundswell um, of community <coughs> character altering overnight. You know, a few new units were created, but it wasn't, you know, it was just an enabling provision. Sure. Well, and there's good and bad ways of doing, uh, there are many houses now <laughs> in town that have been subdivided, however, informally and, um, in some cases, people just start parking in inopportune spots like on town right of ways and lawns disappear. And, uh, you know, so it, it may be aesthetics, but it's not necessarily creating good, high quality parking for. And so I, I realize I'm not pretending that uh, the current situation is ideal either. Um, there's 
better ways of, of proceeding. Um, I'm looking at the clock and we're at that half hour, we're gonna be switching over to hearing from uh, um, Mr. Shoup and Mr. Gregory. Um, so uh, Senator Campion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Ellen, I'm wondering if you, you're still there, I believe. I, I would like you to look up the river corridor piece. Um, I know I keep harking back to this, um, but as I'm understanding it, there is now expansion to allow for development um, in a river corridor that wasn't there before. So that's one of the things I'd like you to look into. I also, Mr. Chair, feel it's necessary to bring up the point that we keep hearing about a lot of things being done in a similar value or a similar a similar set of standards to Act 250, but it's not Act 250 itself. And I do think this committee does need to pull apart more and more what the possible impacts on natural resources would be. And then along those lines, if I could direct, uh, just go quickly, you know, there's been a lot of conversation in the press and as well as in this committee around protecting forest blocks. And I'm wondering if Chris could say a little something about Act 250 and whether or not he believes that uh, we should be protecting forest blocks in Act 250, which are outside, I know, of the actual development, but. Yeah, um, I'm gonna, you know, our focus is our, is our downtown centers and ensuring they are vital and active places. Um, I think A&R really is the expert on, um, our forest blocks, and I would like to defer to them on this question. But I would say that forest blocks are an important piece of just development in general, you know, again, outside of communities where things are being developed. So I'm wondering if you you would just say a word or take a position on whether or not forest blocks would be part of this discussion as it relates to Act 250 and protecting them. Yeah, where I would I would just kind of repeat what I said initially. What you know, by concentrating development within our centers, where we have, um, um, where the re natural resources impacts are less because they're human habitat areas, mm -hmm. it takes the pressure off um, um, development that parcelizes <laughs> our forest blocks. Okay. Well, that's a good transition to, uh, we're really gonna be talking more about forest block tomorrow. But no, thank you for bringing it up. I noticed as uh, Mr. Cochran was speaking that he alluded to taking pressure off of forest blocks and I was gonna say, thank him for mentioning that because uh, one of the other things that we want to put into any kind of amendment we bring forward is not just a development piece, but also a forest block piece. Um, that keep these two traveling together because um, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to talk about one without the other there. Um, okay, and with that, um, so uh, Commissioner Walk, you've been uh, patiently listening this morning. I don't, we're, we're not going too far onto natural resource territory per se at the moment on the, on talking about bylaws and downtown development and stuff like that, but river quarters come up. Uh, do you have anything you wanna share with the committee about the 237 impacts vis-a-vis -vis natural resources? Sure, I guess I, uh, for the record, Peter Watt, Commissioner of the, the Vermont DEC. Um, I've also been taking a sort of lead role with others around the administration trying to help uh, find uh, some uh, shared values on on, on modifications to Act 50. Um, I, I am, what I what I what you are struggling with in this conversation is the uh, is the time in which you have to have this conversation. The details of the discussion that have occurred for the last well, if we, if we want to have a starting point at the beginning of the sort of consideration of Act Forty Seven and then leading into the Commission, you are getting you know a a tiny portion of the deliberation that has occurred. Um, I would say that there has been a lot of discussion around uh, what the natural resource impacts could be in in various um, scenarios around um, downtowns, neighborhood development areas. In fact, the house added uh, designated village centers into that grouping as well. 
Um, these are really our built environments, right? They are those things that are already occurring where from a climate change perspective, from a impact to natural resource perspective, we want that development to occur. We want those opportunities to happen. Uh, the amount of driving that doesn't have to happen when people are able to live where they work and be able to access the uh, activities that they need in their day-to-day -day existence without having to get in their cars and drive is incredibly important to our overall carbon footprint. Uh, we, what is often missing as we think about Act 250 and the discussions around Act 250 is it, it is holistic in a sense but it does not account for every aspect of potential environmental impact, nor, nor can it, frankly. And we talk, uh, Senator Campion, you mentioned this idea of very similar, but not the same. That's the same constant concept that we have that, that, that marks all of our environmental laws. We have different ways of thinking about things because things pop up at different times. They evolve. That's why we have a whole underpinning of of ANR permitting that, that supports the Act 250 process, that provides detail and technical analysis to vague, relatively vague criteria. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna try for a moment, Mr. Chair. What I, the reason I said that is I want us to go into this with eyes wide open, that sometimes language people, I'm not saying people are manipulating language, but I wanna make sure that people that we are cognizant that the values of Act 250 are not the same as actual Act 250 policy. It's as simple as that. That is absolutely correct. I don't think anybody disagrees with you. Oh, oh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Senator McDonnell. Some of the proponents of the bill have suggested that this is no different in policy from what Act 2, the protections are no different from Act 250 and that it is necessary to promote affordable housing. That's the same exact argument that was given when natural resources was bypassed on citing um, cell towers, that the PUC was gonna do the same thing and the only reason we were making the change was because Act 50 was backed up and didn't have the time and it was gonna be the same process and the same et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that didn't turn out to happen. Um, it's it's worrisome. I'm I'm Mr. Chair. Once again, I'm less worried about the proposals that we have here, but they strike me as being one-sided. We've got an Act 250 bill that um, we have before us that is balanced with similar appropriate proposals on the natural resources side in forests and other places, and they're sitting at the bus stop right now while the bus ain't stopping. So um, I'm, I think that's what the problem, one of the problems is here, aside from some of the smaller technical issues, which are resolvable if we're resolving a body of work that's been worked on for a couple of years, not a subsection of that body of work that's been worked on for a couple of months. Thank you. Yeah, I think Senator McDonald, as usual, you know, he's got it. A&R permits and designations aren't the same as, as Act 250. Hi. Right. Um, well, thank you. So I, it's very helpful to hear all these pieces. I think the uh, for this morning, we have another half hour left, so I'd like to turn and we haven't heard from actually the, that sort of in planning and environmental uh, voices yet per se. So how about if we go to uh, Brian Shoup for the next 15 minutes and then Peter Gregory to bat cleanup for the balance of the morning and we'll be done at noon. Thanks. Uh, for the record, Brian Schupp with Vermont Natural Resources Council. Sorry about the lighting in here. Um, I, I appear to be in the witness protection program, but I'm not. Um, we have a lot uh, of notorious witnesses this way. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should be. Um, no, I, I want to thank you guys for, for taking this up. And also, I want to thank um, some of the thoughtful comments and questions regarding kind of the, the larger context of Act 250. Um, 
we um, raised concerns in Senator Sorotkin's committee um, about moving this piece of the of legislation forward, absent the larger context that um, the Commission on Act 250 was set up to, to examine. Um, we were a strong proponent of that process of, of the legislature's um, initiative to, to um, 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 undertake the, the, the comprehensive study of Act 250 that the commission did. We've also been a, a, a strong proponent of the effort of the House um, Natural Resources Committee to um, draft H 926, which is also on your wall. Um, and I'm glad to see you're gonna be taking up tomorrow. Um, our concern is that there's, Act 250 has unfortunately undergone a history of piecemeal and incremental changes um, that have tended to weaken its effectiveness and um, weaken the, the, the level of natural resource protection and community um, protection that it was intended to, um, to um, uh, address. Um, it also hasn't kept up to date in terms of just contemporary changes in science and changes in state regulation and changes in municipal planning and all that. So, um, so we were really pleased to see a comprehensive approach to, to undertaking Act 250. Um, we, and we consider this proposal to exempt development in the downtown and, and the um, neighborhood development areas as just a, 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 another example of the incrementalism and the piecemeal changes to Act 250 that will continue to weaken it. Um, and we would ask you, and we can talk more about this tomorrow when you're going to be talking about um, H926, um, to not look at this jurisdictional issue in a vacuum, to look at it in the context of the commission's work and the House Natural Resources Commission's work, and, and try to have a more of a comprehensive and balanced approach to look at jurisdiction. You've raised the concern about forest blocks quite a bit. Um, we uh, share that concern and would hope that you would look at the forest block provisions of H926 um, that are intended to kind of deal with the scattered, random, low density, kind of high elevation development that's occurring all over the state and undermining the health of our forest and the, and the, the land base necessary for a forest products industry. Um, so having said that, I don't have a lot to add about um, the provision in um, 237, other than we urge you not to look at it as a, as a single um, change to Act 250, but consider a package of changes that would provide more of a balanced approach to dealing with the land use issues that, that Vermont's facing. Okay. Uh, I have a particular question about um, the, one of the proposals as jurisdiction has shifted out of what would have been 250 to a, a municipal plan. Um, does it seem overly, they're not equally rigorous, I would say. And so are, do you have any concerns about extinguishing, uh, being able to extinguish Act 250 conditions uh, and then having someone now regulated at the municipal level? Um, because I would think conditions are imposed for a, they're usually sort of balancing considerations that are baked into a permit, is the way I think of them. And, and so um, if you're going to give up the, the Act 250 permit with those conditions, might you disadvantage uh, adjoiners who were counting on those conditions back when the original permit was granted? Yeah, we were, we were actually very concerned. The initial proposal from the administration was um, to just um, extinguish permits and, and the associated conditions with them. Um, and what, what, just for background, what we're referring to is- Sorry, can you go back to what the administration proposed? Would you repeat that? Okay, yeah, so, it, the, so the issue is if we're gonna exempt Act 250 from these designated areas, yeah. there's, there's 50 years of history of, of permits um, that may have been issued for development in those areas, and they may have conditions associated with them, they often do. Um, and the initial proposal was that they would just be extinguished, they would go away. And we raised the concern that landowners made investment decisions in neighboring properties or you know, neighborhood properties um, that were based on certain conditions and that they, they shouldn't go away. That, that, was, that was part of their um, decision-making process and, and, and how they use their property. 
And um, we had proposed there is a, um, and I'm, I'm on, I'm on get, go, go out on a little bit of thin ice. There's a, a, a Supreme Court case in Vermont, Stowe Club Highlands, which really put a test around how permit conditions should be able to be changed. And what that project was about was um, there was a development that was a subdivision that was created. It had a designated open space lot. Um, and then the review board in that town a couple of years later said, oh, you can build a house on that, on that lot. It's okay, it's not um, open space anymore. Neighboring properties had, had said, wait a minute, I bought my lot here because that was open space. That was the understanding. So, so um, it was determined that that was an illegal change in, in permit conditions. So, so we had said that, we, that there, there needed to be some mechanism in place to allow for um, the people who would be affected by a condition change or, or a condition going away um, to, to be aware of it and there'd be a process for that condition to be changed or, or um, vacated. And that's the test that um, Senator Bray, you're referring to. Whether it's too weak, too generous, um, I would need to look at it again. You know, it is a pretty easy test, but it does it, at least it puts um, the burden on the local review body to go through a process to say, yes, the conditions have changed or, or that's no longer a relevant um, condition anymore. So we can, we can you know, modify it. Um, I think it's, it's, it's better to have that process than to not have it, whether it's a strong test or not. Um, I, I think that's debatable. I think you're muted, Senator Bray. There we go. That's so that my dog doesn't jump in and help uh, unannounced. Um, that dog helps from time to time. The uh, uh, anything else on the the downtown pieces that you want to flag for our attention? No, it, it, it's it's really our concern that um, we don't lose the opportunity to nice. say what are the different jurisdictional challenges and shortcomings of Act Two Hundred and Fifty. Um, and, and look at it in a more comprehensive and balanced manner. Um, I, I guess I do have two other things just to add about some of the prior testimony. Um, I, I do take exception with, with Chris Cochran's characterization that Act 250 is easy to appeal. I, I've actually been involved in appeals of Act 250 permits. It's not easy. It's, it's, um, it's a, really a, a last resort for many neighbors and, and um, other parties to a project. And I also want to be clear that when we're talking about downtowns, I agree that these are built environments. Um, neighborhood development areas aren't necessarily built environments. They're, they're land in close proximity to built environments that are, are suitable for development. Um, but it's not, it's not the designated build up downtowns. The downtowns are um, defined very um, narrowly and um, the neighborhood development areas are defined more broadly and it, by, by design include you know vacant land um so i, I just want to make that distinction that you're aware of okay great thank you uh senator campion so mr chair when will we when are we going to jump into the forest block piece is that more tomorrow fun? okay tomorrow um it'll get its due we're, we're really dividing it into three pieces right uh, uh and okay so th uh, with that then i'd like to um, invite Mr. Gregory to join us, who's been patiently listening all morning. Um, good morning, Peter. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Peter Gregory, director of the Two Rivers Adequichi Regional Commission. Um, thanks for this opportunity just to give you a few thoughts here. Um, I certainly recognize the need for the housing provisions, the chapter 117 changes. Uh, we're engaged in a, a three regional planning commission by state housing study right now to look at impediments to housing development <clears throat> and permitting, while not the most important at all, is one of the facets we're looking at. So some of the changes in here, I think, will help. Um, I would say, before I get into a couple specifics on some changes I'd suggest, is that I've testified in the past that the... Um, Act 250 exemptions for downtowns related to spring more housing development should occur at the same time that we uh, provide further protections for natural resources of statewide importance outside of the built up areas. Um, that's something I've been very consistent on and I think uh, a, a balanced package uh, is something that uh, I see as really important um, 
previous uh, speakers have mentioned that, and I think um, other committee members have alluded to that as well. So I would just throw that out there for your consideration. Um, and just so I make sure I understand that, you mean not only that while a town works, for instance, to get a designated area, that they would then also engage at the same time in doing like force block planning. I mean, we've had these discussions in past years where municipalities were encouraged to do that kind of work. Are you saying right, it's it incumbent on them? If you want one, you also have to do the other sort of planning? Well, I think they're required by law now in town plans to do that kind of, of, of planning, not as rigorous as I'd like to see, but I was referring to Act 250 changes at uh -huh. protecting those statewide resources. Um, okay. But yes, local and regional planning is starting to address forest resources, but uh, um, I think jurisdictional changes in Act 250 for those resources um, should occur at the same time as the downtown uh, exemptions. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've got just three or four small changes I think I'd just like to mention uh, on the uh, Chapter 117 area. Um, in Section 1 of the, the latest draft, um, I've always suggested that uh, town plans, it ought not be optional for them to uh, be consistent with the goals. So I would change the may to shall in uh, Section 1 of the bill, that's in uh, Section 4382. Um, the second change I would like to mention is the opt-out provision for municipalities. Um, it's, it's probably fine that there's a little bit of an off-ramp, but I would suggest that um, DHCD be tasked with uh, appro you know, approving or disapproving those opt-out reports rather than just uh, accumulating them and re uh, reporting to you in a couple of years how many are, are, are taking that avenue. We want to make sure that the justifications communities use uh, are legitimate and, and warranted. Um, just filing it, it's like sending my audit to Indiana and stuff. I don't think anyone ever looks at it. Um, um, and then the, the effective date, the last section, um, I, I think it should be moved up a year, you know, the um, to, you know, say July of 22 rather than July of 23. I know Chair Sorotkin suggested um, a little bit more time for communities uh, to make those changes. Um, I think, you know, with Regional Planning Commission help, uh, those changes can be made, those conversations can be made. Um, housing numbers and quality remain a real crisis here. And I think we need to work uh, faster at, at making these changes. Um, so that, that concludes my thoughts at this point. Oh, you're, you're muted. I'm writing handwriting notes as you go uh, as if, and looking at the screen. Can you email in those point edits you made just so I make sure I cross reference them correctly to the bill, which I also have on another table right next to me. Right. Happy to do so. <laughs> that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. And, um, uh, yeah, so the, the f and by way of reassurance, I mean, it's, it's come up a number of times. So again, we're today, although we're focused on downtowns, tomorrow we're doing force blocks and, uh, and Friday uh, force products industry and uh, recreational trails. Um, and I think the, um, the pathway that we're working on is to try to assemble a package that all travels together, you know, so. Um, I want to acknowledge that and appreciate the fact that people are saying, well, if, don't just pay attention to downtown. You also need to be paying attention to the, the natural environment outside of that downtown. So Thank you. we're, we're going to do both. Um, okay. Any questions for Mr. Gregory? Okay. Um, Senator Campion has been asking uh, some questions following up on river corridors and river corridor planning, floodplains. Um, can you speak a little bit about uh, how that planning happens now and how the bill, Mr. Gregory, would uh, change your role on plannings and floodplain, uh, planning related to river corridors and floodplains? I'm not sure that. There you I'm, I'm sorry, but that question was directed to me. Yes, sir. Sorry. 
Um, well, I think as, as uh, uh, Brian Shoup mentioned, the uh, floodplain work that we would do, you know, is, is, um, is, is, has begun to focus more outside of, of and upstream of downtowns uh, in the, the context of uh, floodplain storage protection, um, uh, making sure communities, uh, you know, kind of keep those lands, uh, you know, functioning as floodplains and stuff to further protect uh, downtowns so we can continue to develop in the downtowns. Is that answering your question? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the part of what I'm wondering about is some of these things would be multi-jurisdictional, right? You might need a town, uh, upstream town, handling its land in a way that's helpful to a downstream town. Or, uh, um, so is that only through RPCs that that kind of work can happen? Um, just wondering um, who, has, who has the reach in order to do that kind of work, coordinated work? Well, we certainly look at those issues, you know, um, irrespective of town boundaries. And to the extent we're invited in by communities to assist them in their planning, uh, or they're willing to accept some suggestions on uh, those issues, we absolutely do provide them. Uh, because we're looking at, uh, you know, we're helping towns prepare hazard mitigation plans and town plans and floodplain ordinances and how to um, administer them properly. So yes, it's usually at the regional planning commission level where we kind of have all that stuff together. And then uh, as towns are uh, ripe for that kind of input, we're there with it. And are we um, making progress in the state? I mean, I think Irene was a wake up call for lots of towns with flooding. Um, if we, uh, did we learn enough out of the Irene experience plus other work that predated that um, to not be, um, to be building appropriately post Irene? I, I think so. You know, the, the longer we have, uh, the, the longer time passes from something as catastrophic as Irene, the harder it is to uh, keep people focused on, on what could happen. But it does seem that we have enough flooding events here on a yearly basis where at least pockets of the state are, are being reminded, uh, you know, all the time about what they should be doing to prepare. Thanks. Um, so, Senator Brayman, jump in there. Uh, yes, please. Uh, talk, talking about our world. Um, just, I asked Rob Evans, who runs the reverse program at, at the DEC to sort of provide me with some, some basic statistics on where we stand uh, in terms of river corridor protection, um, just for, for context. And because this is coming in at the moment, I can't do the overlay with where our designated downtowns are. Um, but uh, by the FEMA database, 249 of our communities are covered by uh, flood hazard bylaws that make them eligible for the flood insurance program. 36% um, of our towns uh, have uh, flood hazard standards that, it, that go above the federal minimum. And 43 of our towns uh, manage their river corridors in similar ways to what we do through Act 250. Uh, so and, and I used the word similar precisely here, Senator Campion, because that was what was given to me by the, um, by the leading expert. Uh, but I, I, my understanding is that those are, that we have built our model bylaws on the way we would do that evaluation uh, under Act 250. That provides coverage for every parcel within those communities and not just those that are subject to Act 250. So, Providing a little bit of context, obviously, I, I, Mr. Gregory is exactly right that we have. Um, Irene is in the in the in the rearview mirror a little bit, but that's not true for the number of smaller, uh, more localized floods that we've had and the number of uh, nationally declared emergencies we have, which are actually continued to tick up since Irene. We just haven't had sort of the statewide issues we had with with Irene. Right, I think uh, Huntington has had a road closed at the Huntington Gorge and permanently closed the gorge. Um, so the, just there, there are these things keep coming. Uh, it's kind of the new normal, severe, severe weather that um, is pretty damaging. I, I just wanted to double back to Senator McDonald's remark about the bus stop 
I mean, I think it's uh, incumbent on the committee working with um, uh, the pro tems office and the economic development committee to make sure that that bus uh, stops at this stop, you know, and picks us up. That's the agreement. And I just want to, I'm not as, I, I'm going to figure we're sticking to that agreement, but I think we're all going to have to be attentive to sort of the full meaning of what that agreement is. The, so I, I don't, I'm not interested in seeing, for instance, sort of a skinnied up version of what we would call a crucial section on force blocks travel with um, uh, a fully robust designated downtown development bill or something like that. They, they, they need to be balanced. And I think that's what we've been, fair and balanced is what we've been talking about for years. And uh, so we'll keep aiming. We need to work at it. Uh, may I ask a quick, or is that, tell me where uh, the genesis of your concern, Senator Bray, with that? Well, you know, I was just thinking back to what Senator McDonald had said, like, we're, we're doesn't want to see our, our areas of particular concern, although everything we're talking about today, tomorrow, and the next day, mm -hmm. I'd say are all our concern. Um, and that we want all of the issues to travel together, get on that bus, not have them left behind. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Is there, is there a, uh, opposition to all three of those groups getting on the bus together? <laughs> well, let's say, not. I mean, let's this, say is, this is what happened in the house. This is right. Everybody was on the bus over there. Yeah, everyone was on the bus and and a few people maybe got off the bus during the trip over or something like really? that. Really? Okay. I'm going <laughs> to, the analogy is going to fall apart pretty soon. So I just say, We'll uh, we'll keep working to have uh, everything travel together, and we'll Absolutely. do our best work. That's thank always you. what we aim for. So, all right. Well, I want to thank everyone. If there are any other questions, comments before we wrap up today, I appreciate people coming in and helping uh, take on uh, as. Commissioner Walk was saying, I think, you know, back the first meeting, the Act 250 Commission was September 25th, 2017. So there's a lot of history behind uh, what we're looking at today in just two hours. Uh, Senator Parent. Uh, I was just, you know, kind of asking, I mean, today's discussion is good, but, you know, to kind of get to the concerns, especially the ones that came out of St. Albans, um, yeah. are we going to be looking for a way to <clears throat> kind of bridge um, you know, you know, I'm in favor of, of doing more to allow more development in these areas, but I also want to give deference to local communities. So are, are we going to be looking, you know, spend some time to discuss a possible solution there or um, where um, do you foresee that? Yes. Thank you for that question. I'd say yes. You know, always when uh, we do two things in the committee, we carry forward local interests and try to make sure they're uh, engage respectfully in the conversation. And then we also think statewide. So uh, we said a bit of a juggling act sometimes to, to play both those roles. I would encourage any member of the committee, including you to reach out to um, Ms. Chikowski, for instance, and say, well, how might we, um, you know, make a, we need to get to language. So I would work with um, Ms. Chikowski to look at how language could be altered in order to address those concerns. Um, because we're all, we need language uh, if we're going to edit. Yeah. So right. you'll, do, you'll do us a favor if you push something forward. Okay. Uh, uh, Senator Bray, may I interject? Um, yeah, please. So uh, as I was providing my testimony, we got off uh, track a little bit as we were talking about uh, the word similar and how it relates to review. Uh, from a broader perspective, and I think you saw this today as, as people wanted to think about package pieces of, of, of Act 250 that go beyond the discussion of designated downtowns and neighborhood development areas, is that this work and the discussion about this and the sort of uh, various back and forth that have occurred over time, you are getting a sort of a really, really thin slice of that in this moment. And, and for those of us who have who have been thinking about and engaging with this 
uh, over the last three plus years, I am I, I am loath to sort of go back to the bus analogy, but there have been multiple different buses with slight variations of routes that have had different people on them at different points and different people have gotten off at different points. And so to, to describe the sort of the, a, a three-legged stool that exists in this, in the discussion that you're happening, I think it, it frankly minimizes much of the other work that's been done and in a, in a much broader sense on Active 50. And I, I appreciate that you do not have time to look at that broader package, but, but two things. One, there significantly more work does need to be done to look at the broader set of, of, of challenges and issues that, that Active 50 modernization was, was intended to address. And I just, you know, I, I would be, I have concerns about sort of thinking that there's a package of things that is, is creates that balance here that exists when there is significant other you know, pieces that, that should have been addressed. And so I wanna make sure that there's an opportunity for us all to be able to come back to this in the future and, and different you know, parties involved have the incentive structure to be able to do that work. Sure, so sure. I think it's, that's incredibly important. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, uh, we know this is a ongoing, uh, you know, work in progress. I, I hesitate to say this, but we're only about six months away from the opening day of the next biennium. And uh, so we do incremental work sometimes and, um, and then come revisit something and, and add to it, you know. So I think the point in my mind would be, to do things in a constructive way, even if they're incomplete, that allows for and, and anticipates more work in a, a next biennium. Um, what I don't wanna do is sort of throw the spanner in the works in some way that um, causes complications, unuseful complications for that future work. Senator Campion, last word to you and then we're adjourning. Thank you. I just wanna, the three people on the bus, are we referring to the three parts that we've, that the House and the administration have agreed on, which is, you know, traveling together. This is, in, correct me, the forest frag, the downtown, and the uh, the trails. Mr. Chair, is that, is that what we're talking about when we're talking about? Uh, the That's the three legs that I generally the, I called that the three-legged stool, and I just want to be clear that that's not a position the administration has taken. So the administration is is not uh, in a, does not okay. I thought the administration had agreed to that in the house, but that no. I guess would be a conversation. We have we we worked to deal with much a much broader package in the house, and as things fell off, uh, we have we have not been supportive of how they've ended up. So if you're going to just tackle those three issues, no, we're not going to be supportive of that as a package. Okay, and so. Um, Commissioner Watt, just so I have it straight, did the, the administration support 926 as passed by the House in the end? We have not been asked in a while, frankly, what our support of, of where that bill was going, but we do not support as how it came out of the House, no. Okay, all right. Well, although we're optimists in this committee, we're going to end on that down note there. <laughs> <laughs> and adjourn for the day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And see you to uh, well, see see you on the floor at one, and other folks again tomorrow at ten.